of San Antonio. That's buying another Bible, King James Bible. But whew, I'm having a hot flash. <laughs> um, I don't think I had a King James Bible though. I'm not sure that I did. And the thing is, is that I give them away. I like giving Bibles away. I have a note. I write a note in the front of it. It says, "Hi, this is Bill." And if you take this Bible, you're going to go to hell. No, that's not what it says. That's not what it says. It's what? Oh, my word. Did I just say that? I'm worse than Justin Enoch. <laughs> if you take this Bible, read it. That's what it says. It says, and if you don't want to read it, then call me and return it to me, and I'll give it to somebody that does. Amen. So there's Bibles all over the place. Amen. The Gideons, they used to put out Bibles, right? Am I in trouble, Mary, but I said something No, but I was thinking, when I was, <laughs> wait, wait, I got a story. When I was newly saved, uh -huh. I went to the YMCA in Raleigh, North Carolina, where it's a in North Carolina, in Brooklyn, North Carolina. And I, I didn't lock my locker and put my new amplified Bible in. When I came back, it was, it was gone. Somebody stole my Bible. See, but stealing Bible. I know, and that was like in 1982. So I'm just praying that person that stole my Bible got well, and, and they and they probably did. So in your Bible, in your Bible, if if here you go, if you choose to keep this, be sure to read every word of it. Read the book of Matthew first. I love you in Christ. If found, please call Bill Price. Do you write that in your Bible? Just a thought. Well, okay, so fine. If you're not willing to carry around a Bible, then carry around a track. Everybody see that I left tracks out? Yeah. So you can get more money. You don't have to tackle somebody and, and hit somebody with a track. I found one in the bathroom the other day. I saw one sitting on a table at the airport. Amen. So we want to make sure we give you guys these tracks. You'd be surprised at the uh, at uh, people. They'll pick these up and they'll read these tracks and they'll be like, <clears throat> interesting. And next thing you know, somebody will accept Christ as their Lord and their Savior. Amen? All right. All right. You guys are awful quiet this morning. Everybody okay? Yeah, we okay? Yeah. Amen. All right. So if you're a visitor here today, we have a special guest or a gift for you. It's a CD. We like to give away these CDs. So, man, I got a CD for you. What is your name? Olga. 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 Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. There you go. There's a gift for you. If you figure out who that is, there's another gift for you. I, I have 1,500 of those. I'm trying to get rid of them. <laughs> Did she figure it out? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a nice gift, right? Amen. All right. So who had something amazing happen to you this week? Anyone? Nothing amazing happened to you this week? A miracle. I had four or five souls say Friday night. Mm -hmm. All right, there we go. Yeah, there was four, a young man and three young ladies that came forward on Friday night. We do an altar call every Friday and celebrate recovery. Hmm. I don't know if the other ones do that or not, but I, I can't imagine why they wouldn't. Um, and each week, there are people that come, and I. I've had people say to me before, you know, Bill, how do you know that person is really accepting Christ, that they're being filled with the Holy Spirit? And I told them, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Rarely do we meet these folks again. They move on to other, they move on to other places. They finish their treatment. You know, they'll be in a 28-day uh, program. Or, um, does anybody know the book of Hebrews? Oh, there. Right. I know where the book of Hebrews is. Rarely do these folks come back. Or they'll come back.
back for a few weeks or something like that, and then they, they move on. And we don't get, so we don't know what happens to them. Um, I have asked Jake if he'll start getting their name and, and their, you know, their uh, email or something so we can stay in touch with them. But you just never know. You just never know. And so, yeah. Miracles, that's a miracle, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Somebody getting born again? It's absolutely a miracle. <laughs> Amen. So we're seeing miracles here at Thrive Worship Center. Anybody else have something really cool happen this weekend? Yes, ma'am. I, I knew you were going to give us something. Come on. Oh, I said I've been praying for one of my classes. He's like, well, I guess I have a field to care about. So I've just been helping him one on one. I've been tracking him down and studying all of them. Like, I know he does this. I'm really smart. He got an 85% on my chassis test. So Sweet. I, I, that, yeah. I mean, that's like, you know, but I, God just put on my heart to pray for him. I cannot even imagine being a teacher today. You know, when I was in high school, I started high school in Washington, D.C., actually in Fairfax County, which was a very progressive area of the United States. And they had built the first modular high school in the nation in Fairfax County for all the rich kids, all the military kids that were up there. And there was no walls. There was no, there were, the rooms were this big. I mean, they were it's like small rooms, you know, and they had little modules and stuff. And, and uh, I did uh, ninth grade there. And, and, and by the time I got to, I was in four high schools. By the time I got to 12th grade, I was sitting in a history class in this little, kind of a country school, quite frankly, Coleman High School, Coleman, Alabama, right between good hope and no hope. No hope. <laughs> Amen. And I made a smart comment to the teacher, and he wanted to paddle me. I'm like, what? You think you're paddling me? Dude, what, what century are you in? You know what I'm talking about, don't you, Gary? I couldn't believe it. They paddled people in this school. They did. Yeah. They did. Maybe, yeah, maybe, did. maybe we need to do a little more of that. I don't know. But yeah. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Hey, we're going to look at Hebrews 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. And I, I just want to <coughs> kind of get us caught up on, get us caught up on, 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 on what we're going to learn this morning. In chapter 4 of Hebrews, we, um, we learned that, uh, that, that, that chapter 4 is an exhortation. And it's about exhorting us to enter into God's rest. And God's rest, that doesn't just mean that you get to sleep at night. <laughs> Amen. It'd be awesome if, if all of us could. Some of us don't sleep so well at night. And uh, I, I'm lucky I can fall asleep on a park bench and it, uh, and by a train station, but some, some folks can't. And what it really, I think there, it, it's saying here is that we enter God's rest eternally. Amen? We are able to, we know, we know as a Christian, and uh, the, as the camera is one running, I always clarify what a camera is to our friends out there in Facebook, and the, a Christian is someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. And the reason that they are filled with the Holy Spirit is because God desires it. He calls us to a place where we will humble ourselves before God. You know, we have no trouble humbling ourselves in other places. And, uh, and we, we humble ourselves. And God places that call of repentance in our life. We do repent of our sins. And the Lord gives us faith. And we have the ability to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he lived a life here on earth, he died on the cross, and today he is our great high priest. And we're going to come to the great high priest in just a couple of minutes. So that's a Christian, right? So it's, it's talking about going through life and knowing that there is, there is rest to come. Jesus Jesus says that, or the Bible says that in heaven there will be no more tears, right? No more pain. Amen. And let's face it, life has, it has tears and it has, it has pain. There's no doubt about it. 
I, I read something I thought was kind of interesting. It says that a father watched through the window as his small son attempted to lift a large stone out of his sandbox. And the boy couldn't get enough leverage to lift the rock over the side. So his sandbox had those wooden things, you know, and there was sand inside of it, right? And finally, the little boy gave up and he sat on the edge of the sound sandbox with his head in his hand. hand. What's wrong, son? Can't you lift that rock out, the dad asked. No, sir, the boy said. I cannot do it. Dad says, have you used all the strength that's available to you, the father asked. And the little boy said, yeah, dad, I've used all the strength I have. And dad says, no, you haven't. He says, you haven't asked me to help. Amen. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to ask for his help. He wants us to be at rest. He, he, <coughs> that Hebrews 4 uh, uh, warns us not to harden our hearts. You know, you, you, you don't want to harden your heart. You say, Pastor Bill, how do I harden my heart? By pushing God away. And you can sure enough push God away. Your life. You can live a life even as a Christian pushing God away. He doesn't move, but you do. And your heart, it's a metaphor, your heart, it becomes hard, right? If we look at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7, and I'm going to give you some scripture today, so you might want to write these down. Hebrews 3 and uh, verse 7, it says, So as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. So the Jews, right, after the exodus, the Jews started grumbling, the children of Israel, and their hearts became hard. And because of that, God caused them to go through the wilderness for 40 years. The whole generation, he did not allow them to come into the promised land. God wants us here now today. He wants us to come into the promised land, the kingdom of heaven. And how do we see the kingdom of heaven? Well, we give our life to Jesus Christ. But if we have a hard heart, it makes it kind of difficult. It says, it says that that we then we then learned in last week that, that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, dividing even soul and spirit. And I explained to you the difference between soul and spirit. So I don't need to go to that right now. I think that most of us understand the difference. But it's really important to know that the word affects the innermost areas of our life. The word of God it will affect the innermost area of your life. And if you consider the word of God being literally Jesus as the word of God, Jesus will affect every area of your life. If you believe that the actions of the Holy Spirit are actually actions of Almighty God, that will affect your entire life, and you'll never be the same. Amen? And also, we, we learned last week that the Holy Spirit, that, I'm sorry, that Almighty God actually is interested in the motives of our hearts. So before we get into verse 14, let us understand that the motives of our heart are very, very important. I told you last week that, that I, I, this one really nailed me, because I realized that I have bad Intention sometimes. My motives aren't right. Amen. I, I, and I don't want that. And unfortunately, when you consider the word of God and it causes you to, it pricks your conscience. I, maybe that isn't unfortunate. Maybe it's fortunate that it pricks your conscience and you realize that you have bad motives. You say to go, <clears throat> who cares? Nobody can see me. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on there. God can see you, he, and he does see you. I wrote down here that if you're a new Christian or a Christian that has never made an, an effort to learn about your faith, you will not explore the motives of your heart. Most people just don't. They're just completely oblivious of it. Completely oblivious. I remember years and years ago when somebody finally had the nerve to say to me, Bill, you have 
have a temper. You are a hothead, and, and people are tired of it. I didn't even know. I'm like, isn't this how everyone is? I guess not. Probably most men, but, but uh, and we go through that. There are men that are raised by really wonderful uh, parents, and they don't have hotheads, but, but um, yeah, my dad was a hothead. And so we find out that our heart, which we, we don't want to harden, is actually the seat of our soul. Amen. Again, metaphorically. And so as we as we think about this, um, we uncover um, and the Bible says that that it's that these motives are uncovered. They are laid bare before God, before the eyes of God, whom we we must give an account. Amen. I'm going to give you four verses. Write these down and please read them later later in the interest of time. These are about the giving an account of. Or the judgment of God in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 in 2nd Chronicles chapter 16 verse 9 in Job 34 verse 21 and Psalm 33 and 13 and Angie you're probably over there typing those things are popping them up on Facebook by the way my goodness how rude of me hi you're, you're watching Thrive Worship Center in Vienna, West Virginia, and um, we record our, our, the message every Sunday, and the reason we do this is because we hope that this will bless you, and for the first time a couple weeks ago, somebody from another state sent us a text and asked for prayer. I, I, was, so, I was so happy about that, I just jumped for joy. We had, uh, during COVID, when, it was, when they were all, everybody was shut in, we had like 25,000 views, but nobody sent a text saying, uh, will you pray for me? So last week was the first time. Maybe there'll be more of those. I pray that's the case. And so I, I wrote a note here. It says, how marvelous this is that God cares about mankind, about the fashioning of our hearts. The Bible says God fashions our hearts, right? It says, so that we will have the opportunity to be at rest. Now, Hebrews 4, 12, and 13 really are kind of uh, uh, very austere verses, if you will. A lot of people think that it's like, well, why does God have to be judgmental? Why can't he just give us a break? So it's like, okay, fine, I understand. So let me give you some, some good news this morning. As we continue with verse 14, we can, perhaps we can kind of lighten that load that you might be carrying as you think that God only is judge metal. Amen. So let's read Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. We'll read this together. I'm reading a new international version of the Bible. You may have a King James or American Standard or something like that. The Bible says, Jesus, the great high priest, is the is the uh, headline here. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold, hold firmly to the faith that we pro profess. And verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin. In verse 16 it says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may have received mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And you know what? I, I want to take a moment here and I, I want to issue an apology. I'm standing here thinking, what a stupid thing I said at the beginning of this service. And I'm sorry. That was stupid to say, if you take my Bible, you're going to hell. It's bothering me. My conscience is, is being pricked. Will you accept that apology? Even if you thought it was funny, realize it wasn't funny. You know, sometimes I say things that are kind of stupid. But... Amen. So I'm sorry for that. Now, I want to read this again. Having said that. So read this with me again, please. Amen. Verse 14 through 16. 
Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. Now, this idea that Jesus went through the heavens, there are some theologians that believe that it meant Jesus came to earth. And there are, of course, many verses that talk about that, that Jesus humbled himself even unto death on the cross. He took on the appearance of man. He took on the, uh, he, he became a servant. And it is true that, that God, that, that Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that God himself incarnated, and he left the sublime realm of heaven. He came to earth, and he went through everything that we have experienced. Jesus went through it. I mean, think about it. He lived in uh, um, a little town, <laughs> dirt roads, um, no running water in the house. I don't know what they ate. I'm sure it was good. I don't know. Baklava. I, I don't know. <laughs> but whatever it was, I'm sure it was yummy. They didn't have running water. They had to go down to the Jordan to get the water. You know, they, I mean, what did they do when they get sick? They, you know, they, they didn't have just hospitals. You know. Jesus lived the same life that we live. And none of us, none of us have experienced a, a, an event like Jesus has or did. Now, I don't want to be insensitive. I don't know who here in this room may have had things, maybe multiple things that had happened in your life. That you, it would cause you to think, you know, God, why are you picking on me? Um, I have known, I have been to third world countries, two or three of them, in my travels in the, in the military. And I remember a village we went to on the island of Mauritius, off the uh, 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 east coast of Africa. And th that it was a, a tourist place for the French. Beautiful hotels and and casinos and all this routine, but it didn't take very long to find the the uh, uh, the native people living out in the I don't know jungles or whatever of Mauritius in huts, the kids running around uh, without shoes on, you know. Um, I, 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 they didn't know that was the hard life; they were having a blast. Amen. You go to some third world countries and the, and the people, they don't know. As a matter of fact, you bring in the Western culture into the third world country and next thing you know, you're starting to rot it by bringing in the, the, some, some of the stuff that Americans do. You know, I'm not so sure that, that allowing the internet in, um, in some areas of the world, maybe no areas of the world, is really such a great idea when it comes to the evil that is available on the internet. And, and now Jesus certainly wasn't tempted by the internet, but the Bible says that Jesus was tempted just as we are by all things. And he was tempted by Satan himself. Who has met Satan lately? Just kind of had a chat with him. No one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the likelihood of Satan having ever been in the same place you're in or have been, I, I think is extremely remote. I would say that Satan is... Uh, uh, probably hold up uh, down the shaft of the abyss, but hold on, I'm getting some funny looks. There are millions of devils and demons that do the work of Satan. Satan is not uh, omnipresent. He's not omniscient, he's not omnipotent. Uh, he's he'll live forever. But he's not all of those things that God is. He can't be in several places at once. But there are millions and millions of demons. And they will tempt us. Jesus was tempted by Satan himself. Now, is it possible that you've ever engaged Satan? I suppose so. Uh, I, I, uh, I hope I have. I'll tell you that. But I know one thing. I know that there are angels that are fighting off those demons. We are Christians. You know the verse, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, right? And so Jesus not only lived in uh, a little town, no running water, uh, I don't know, the food was that good, you know, but they were happy. They, have a, they had a good life, right? But Jesus was tempted by Satan himself. 
Amen. And the Bible says that that he didn't that he didn't sin. And and we, we can understand what this means as we as we look at. Uh, I want to read a quote from you from my uh, Bible upstairs. I have a big old fat Bible, you know, the one you carry around so you look like I'm a Christian. You got my big fat Bible going on here. Right. OK. Right. I want to read this quote to you and then we're going to move on to the next portion of the verse. And today I'm going to do what's called sermon sharing. Rusty actually is going to come and take five, eight minutes, maybe ten minutes. And Mary is going to come, and she's going to share with you too. Okay? So, actually, um, let me read this quote, and then we're going to get right to the next part of the sermon. Because we normally end at noon, and I want to, I want to honor that. So, it's, it says, it, I read this in my Bible, it says that Jesus Christ is both God and man. He is exalted. He is the eternal Son of God. He is the full expression of God's being. And he acted as God's agent in creation. And he sustains all things by his powerful work. God will someday subject all things to him. And at the same time, Jesus is fully human. He suffered an atoning death on the cross. But then he sat down at the right hand of the Father where he intercedes for us. I know all of you here in this room know that Jesus is in heaven talking literally. I believe he is literally interceding for us to the Father. Amen. And you folks on the camera may not know that, though. Jesus is praying for you. Did you know that? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And there's been no greater person that, who ha that has ever lived. So as we, as we consider the next part of the scripture, I'm going to ask that, that Rusty would come up now. It says here in verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. So Rusty's going to tell us about a high priest. Amen. Okay, I'm going to read a article here I guess it's just a brief overview and then I'll say a few things about the high priest the high priest was a man appointed by God to oversee the tabernacle in the wilderness a position a position of sacred responsibility God chose Aaron brother of Moses to be the first high priest and Aaron's sons to be priests to assist him Aaron was from the tribe of Levi one of the twelve sons of Jacob the Levites were put in charge of the tabernacle and later the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, in worship at the temple, the high priest was set apart from all other men. He wore special garments made of yarn, that's the colors of the gate and the veil that was in the temple, symbolic of God's majesty and power. In addition, he wore an ephod, which is a, a hat, an intricate vest, and held two onyx stones on each shoulder. Each stone was engraved with the names of six of the tribes of Israel. He also wore a breastplate holding twelve precious stones, each engraved with the name of one of the tribes of Israel. A pocket in the breastplate held the Urim and the Thummim, mysterious objects used to determine God's will. The garments were completed with a robe, a tunic, a sash, and a turban or hat. On the front of the turban was a gold plate engraved with the words, that say holy to the Lord. When Aaron made sacrifices in the temple, he acted as a representative of the people of Israel. God spelled out the duties of the high priest in painstaking detail to drive home the seriousness of sin and the need for atonement. God threatened, uh, God threatened the high priest with death if the rituals were not carried out exactly as commanded. <coughs> Once a year, on the day of atonement of Yom Kippur, the high priest entered the holy day or the holy of holies to make amends for the people's sins. Entry to this most sacred place was restricted to the high priest and allowed only one day out of the year. It was separated from the other chamber in a tent of meeting by a colorful veil. Inside the holy of holies was the ark of the covenant. This is where the high priest acted as a mediator between the people and God. He was present in a cloud and a pillar of fire above the mercy seat of the ark. The high priest had bells on the hem of his robe so that other priests would know if he had died as the bells went silent. The high priest 
of the high priest Jesus Christ, of all the elements of the wilderness tabernacle, the, the office of high priest was one of the strongest promises of the coming Savior, Jesus Christ. While the tabernacle high priest was the mediator of the old covenant, Jesus became the high priest and mediator of the new covenant, interceding for humanity. Christ's role as high priest is spelled out in the book of Hebrews, we read some of 414 and Hebrews 10, 18, as the sinless son of God, he inequally qualified or unequally qualified to be the mediator and yet has, has compassion with human sin. Jesus' priesthood is superior to that of Aaron because through his resurrection, Christ has eternal priesthood. Uh, Hebrews 7, 17 talks about that. We'll probably get into that. Uh, Melchizedek was a priest of the king of Salem to whom Aaron, Abram gave tithe. Even though the offerings made at the desert tabernacle were sufficient to cover sin, their effect was only temporary. Sacrifices had to be repeated in contrast to Christ's substitu substitutionary death on the cross. It's once for all event. Because of his perfection, Jesus was the final sacrifice for sin and the ideal eternal high priest. Ironically, two high priests, Caiaphas and his father-in-law, Annas, were the key figures in the trial and condemnation of Jesus, whose sacrifice made the, er uh, made the earthly office of high priest no longer necessary. Well, I think Andy put up a picture there. You can see, uh, not a very good picture, but you can see sort of there what, how the high priest was dressed. Uh, the importance of the high priest, he had lots of duties, but probably his primary importance was that once a year, he had to enter the Holy of Holies, and he had to take and sprinkle the blood of animals on the mercy seat. If you can picture him going through the veil, okay, and there's an Ark of the Covenant which contained the articles of the manna, a golden jar of manna that the children of Israel ate when they were in the desert. It also contained the rod of Aaron, which budded when they sinned in the desert. And it also contained the Ten Commandments or the commandments of God that were on the plaques. So when the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies once a year, he would take the blood of an animal and he would go in and there were two cherubim, one on each side of the uh, mercy seat. And on the, in the center, God dwelt above the mercy seat and he would take that blood and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat and when God looked down through into the Ark of the Covenant where the sins of the people were represented and the law was represented and you knew that that law had been broken because of those sins that were present he had to look through the blood of the bull and the goats or, or whatever animal uh, was used and that temporarily covered the sins of the people now if you can imagine Jesus comes later and spills his blood and he becomes a high priest. And there's a place in the scripture, I don't remember, you might remember where it's at, Pastor, that talks about after Jesus was uh, rose from the dead, I think it was some ladies approached him and he, and he said, don't handle me yet. Do any of you remember that scripture? He says, don't handle me yet because I have not yet ascended to the Father. What was he talking about? He had not yet ascended into the Holy of Holies and in the heavenly temple and placed his blood on the mercy seat so that when God looks down at us, if we have accepted him as our Savior, if we have, if we have given him place in our life, then God looks down and he looks through the blood of Jesus Christ, which is not temporary. It does not just cover the sins. It washes our sins away. So when he looks down through the blood on the mercy seat, he does not see our sins he sees the blood of Jesus, which is eternal. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rusty. Wow. Last night I um, read um, the portion of scripture, several chapters, about how the temple, the, uh, the temple was made. Read that. It's amazing. All the cubits and the gold and the loops and the, and the curtains and just it's just amazing. It's well, I found it to be amazing. I don't know if you may 
me out. I find it so amazing. But, but, uh, but uh, what, what's Rusty saying? That we have a great high priest. And he is indeed. He has, he has died for our sins. And our sins aren't just covered. They are removed. Continuing on with our with our uh, scripture, it says, that, therefore, it says in verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Before Mary comes, I want to say something about this. It isn't saying that we approach the throne of grace with oh, confidence. I am saved. I am a no sin boy. <laughs> no, that's not what that is saying. It's saying that we must know, to know scope in our deepest, deepest heart, that we are, we are encouraged. We are not just allowed to. But we are, it's God this, God's desire that we do, that we come. We, have, we know that we have confidence. And when I approach God in moments where I'm having a, wow, really a God moment, I, I, I need some help. I don't go Mr. Chest out, head up, you know, bright eyed. But I, I'm on my knees. I don't know about y'all. But I would suggest that to approach that throne of grace, do it with humility. Do it with, cry, cry out to God. Call out to him, and he will answer you. Mary, come tell us about the throne of I grace. I don't have a chalkboard. I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> you don't have a chart? You know chalkboard. Those, chalkboard. Oh, you want a chalkboard? Not, I can get you one. I don't have a chalkboard. Okay, you got three minutes. I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> kidding. Thank you. We got, we, we're good. We got seven minutes. Uh, all right. I'm going to okay. read, I'm gonna read the verse, uh, verse 16 from the New King James. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And when Phil asked me to, you know, talk about the throne of grace, I Googled it and I found a 20, like 25 page sermon by Charles Spurgeon. But I went through, but basically, I, I love the summary of things here. It's basically, he talked about the throne, he talked about grace, and he talked about grace on the throne. So the throne, and just like Bill said, when, when you think about approaching a king, you know, approaching royalty, approaching someone high in authority, you're not gonna, you're not gonna like, no. you know, whatever. You're not gonna come like in a, in a cocky way. It's basically you're gonna come with lowly reverence, and I don't think that means like sliding on the ground, but lowly reverence, reverence, because he's the king of kings. God is the king of kings and the lord of lords, and we're sinners. We already are, folks. We're sinners. All right, joyfulness. He wants us to come with joyfulness. So I, you know, I, if you get invited to meet the king, it's like you're going to be a little bit nervous, but I really believe you're going to be joyful, okay? So, I mean, we're going to have an audience. We can have an audience with the king. Is that awesome? Also, complete submission. Complete submission. We don't want to, we don't want to carry anything. I don't know. We don't have warts and scars. I, you know what I mean. We don't want to carry baggage to the king. You know, we, we want to we want to be completely submitted. We want to lay down things before we we go and approach the king. And also, I, I just love these words, these Spurgeon words, enlarged expectation. He is he's over the universe, so our expectations should be so enlarged if we're invited to have an audience with the king. It's really cool. All right, so that's the throne. Grace. That's the it's it's, it's really important because it's not just the throne because you know we can kind of legally approach him, but grace. That's, that's after the death of Jesus Christ, grace. Um, we're not going to a throne of law. We're going to the throne of the King of Kings who gave his son for, for us. And, um, but in, when, when we're not going to the throne, throne of grace, we wouldn't be able to approach it. But in Christ, our faults will be overlooked. Our faults. Again, we have to lay down our sins. We have to confess our sins to him, but our faults. We all have faults, guys. Yeah, we all have faults. We do. <laughs> Our faults will be overlooked. Our faults will not prevent the success of our prayers. Sometimes I think when I really blow it, I'm like, I can't even approach you, Lord. I can't even approach you. But um, our faults don't stand in the way. Our faults don't stand in the way. Our desires will be, I can't read my writing. Our desires will be interpreted. Ooh, 
all our wants will be supplied. So we can approach the throne, but it's a throne of grace. And just bottom line, grace on the throne in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is grace on the throne. And then I read, I, I read verse 13 again. I love this. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. That shouldn't terrify that us. That should just give us such rejoicing that we can't hide anything from him. He knows us inside and out, so that should give us great confidence. Amen. Thank you very much. to us the great high priest and you can you can view you can view in your own mind's eye Jesus as the great high priest and I recommend that you do that can you imagine what Melchizedek looked like I bet he was a really cool dude you know a tall guy with the robes and the turban I mean just really I just just sometimes just kind of imagine that and so so what I'm going to close here in about in about uh, two minutes here. I, I want to ask a question. I want to ask a question. What does this mean to us? Why is why is all this that we 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 just discussed important? How do we apply it to our life? Right. We need to do that. And so I'm going to just going to read through it, and then I have a little clo closing um, uh, story I want to share with you. It, you see, life must be kept in perspective. It's so important that you keep things in perspective. We have trials and temptations. We have fears. We have failures. We have, we have deep pain sometimes in our heart. The, the deepest pain that, that, that anyone possibly could imagine. Oh, God, how am I going to get through this? But the cool thing you said was, oh, God, how am I going to get through this? And I, may I say, don't let it be the last thing you say. Let it be the first. How many people do you know that, that say, oh, we're out of options here. Guess we better pray. You know, let it be the first thing that you do. And understand that Jesus felt our pain. Jesus, the greatest pain that's ever been experienced in the universe of mankind was not, as I said on Wednesday night, was not the nails to the wrist was not the scourging, was not the nails through the feet. Um, in that Pain, absolutely. This crown of thorns. We did a play in New Hope Baptist Church one time, and, and I got to be Jesus, I don't know what they were thinking. They put the crown of those thorns, I'm going to tell you, that hurt. It stuck a little, just a teeny little bit. And they, you know, the guy that played Jesus in The Temptation of the Christ, he was on the cross during the filming and was struck by lightning. Did you know that? Yes, sir. Look it up. Yeah, that guy is a ferocious Christian today. Um, yeah, that's right. So understand that, that, that Jesus, but the greatest pain of all was not the, not the nail. It wasn't the lashing. It wasn't the, the humility. It wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, the, no, the, the, the embarrassment or whatever. It wasn't that. Well, the greatest pain of all was when God took the sins of mankind and put them in Jesus' heart. I think Jesus died of a broken heart when you think about it. Amen? Number two, hold fast to your confession of faith. As you are obedient to the teachings of Jesus, your perspective will remain balanced. Your vision will become 2020. I promise you that. Many people have trouble. I just don't feel God. I'm, I just don't sense that he's in the room. I, I'm not getting the liver quiver shiver. And I, you know, hogwash. How to say to that? That's hogwash. You know, do we experience sometimes uh, some sort of supernatural or unique sensation in the presence of God? I did on Friday night. I, I'm going to tell you I did. We were on our knees praying, and my entire, the entire back of my head and my neck and my back became very warm. 
And I'm sitting there going, oh, holy moly, what's going on here? Now, I've experienced something like that before, but it was a physical experience. And I thank God for that. I, I thought that, wow, this is just amazing. And then we got to pray for a little girl that is blind. How wonderful the experience was. But keep in mind that we don't get to this point. We don't get to this point where we, we feel this, this, this perspective and this 2020 vision by liver shivers. We get to it by obedience. Yeah, if you love me, obey my commandments. My Father will love you. I too will love you. We will make our home in your heart. And once you have reached that place of obedience in your life, where you say, I'm not going to do that. And if I do do it, I'm going to apologize to this person. I'm going to go to them, humble myself and say, I'm sorry. Because they will see Christ then. They didn't see Christ when you were rude at the kitchen table or the, the table in the restaurant, which is, yeah, I do that too sometimes. You get a little snippy. You know, they don't see Jesus then. But you apologize. They'll see Jesus then, right? And once we, under, we, once we are obedient to Christ, then we begin to understand and it's in the understanding that we are able to make sense of scriptures like this. And finally, God through Jesus and the power within us, the Holy Spirit, is accessible at all times. Don't just call out to him at your last resort. Call out to him daily. Mary daily. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't fix this. Up. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. Do you know what my baby name was? Smith. Weeks. 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 I went from weeks to days. Many weeks. Very weeks. 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 And, uh, all the time. Don't let it be a last resort. And, and go to the throne of grace. The, the, to the great high priest. Knowing that he's going to. He's going to receive our praises. He's going to receive our adoration to him. And also. He's going to receive our grumblings. Too. God, God gets it. He, he does. Alright I'm going to close with this. Philip Yancey. In his book. Prayer. If you haven't read any Philip Yancey and you want to you want to get a little deeper with God, I recommend him. Amazing. Philip Yancey. Here's what he says. He says that experiences with God cannot be planned or achieved. They are spon spontaneous, excuse me, not do. They are spontaneous moments of grace. Almost accidental. A rabbi said that in a classroom, by the way. They're almost accidental, he said to his students. And his student, one of the kind of smart out of students, a little skeptical student, he says, hey, if God's realization is just accidental, then why do we want to work at it so hard? And the teacher said, why do we want to work at these spiritual practices? And the teacher says, to be accident prone as possible. Amen. To be as accident prone as possible. So go to God. All the time. Knowing he's your high priest. Knowing that he loves you. That he died for you. And as I, I bring this to a close this morning. I, I say to those watching by Facebook. That you can come to Christ. You don't have to be in a stadium. You don't even have to be in a church. You can come to Christ by simply getting on your knees right where you are and just giving your life to Jesus. Talk to God. Say, God, I realize now that I need you. I'm a sinner. Forgive my sins. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. And give your life to him. The Holy Spirit will enter into your life and you will be saved. And then... Do two things. Tell someone who's been praying for you for a long time. Probably grandma or grandpa, mom and dad, brother, sister. Go to them and tell them that you prayed that prayer. Make sure that you get yourself a Bible. 
basic instruction before leaving earth and make sure that you find a church that teaches the Bible. I pray that you prayed that prayer this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all stand up. Amen. Amen. All right. Father, we thank you for a wonderful time this morning, God. We thank you for this place that you provided for us. We thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to give. We have the opportunity to learn. We have the opportunity to serve that you've given us this wonderful place. I pray, Lord, you continue to bless this place that we call Recovery Hill. And I bless these dear people as they seek after you this week. I pray, Lord, that you distribute new gifts unto these folks. I pray, Lord, that everyone is safe. I pray that you are well. And Father, we pray for those out there that are sick with the COVID-19 and other illnesses as well. And we ask you to bring healing to them. So we give all these things to you, these prayers to you, and this time to you. We pray this. And everybody say this with me now. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Hey, before you go, tonight at 6 p.m. at the Jungle Drive-In, I have no idea. Oh, yeah, I've been there one time. We're the praise team, our team plus Jim Runyon is playing. They do this uh, Christian evening there, Rusty, right? Somebody does a message. Uh, yeah. 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 Cool. There'll be a message after the music. So if you want to come hang with us, we'll be there. It, it'll be fun. Amen. And we're giving away a Cadillac after the meeting. Right. Oh. Don't, don't forget about our new offering box.